All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Good uh, evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, this evening symposium as part of the chess uh, meeting. It's unfortunate we can't be together in, in person, but uh, we'll make the best of, of what we can in our in our new reality of uh, virtual <laughs> presentation. So uh, fingers and toes crossed that the uh, all these things work for tonight. So so again, welcome to the uh, IPF uh, Disease Challenge. Uh, my name is Kevin Flaherty. I'm a lung doctor at the University of Michigan and work with the LD program there tonight. And it's a real pleasure to be uh, with Dr. King uh, this evening, who is the Associate Medical Director of the Transplant Advanced Lung Disease Program at Inova Fairfax Hospital and Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University. Chris, welcome and thanks for, for being here this evening. No, thanks for having me. I'm hopefully we get some attendees and uh, you know people are engaged in the game and uh, should be fun. Yeah, I've done one of these before with this Kahoot platform and it was a lot of fun. So hopefully we can uh, get some uh, some feedback and see how this goes. Um, if you want CME, I'm not going to go through all the words on the slide, but there is a QR code that you can scan um, and it gives you instructions on how to get um, continuing education credits for participating um, in this uh, symposium this evening. So we have a few pretest questions. Uh, the first one is based on available real world data. Whoops, I can't read it. Uh, what percentage of patients with IPF discontinue therapy after starting an antifibrotic? So 20, 10%, 20%, 40%, or 50%? All right, our second pretest question. Which of the following statements reflects our current understanding of antifibrotic therapy for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Profenadone is more efficacious than a tentative in men. Profenadone has demonstrated improved survival while an tentative has not. Based, based on clinical data, they are equally efficacious. Our third pretest question. The importance of educating the entire multidisciplinary care team on recognizing signs and symptoms of IPF for, excuse me, for early referral is highlighted by delays in diagnosis, which are often as long as one to six months, seven to 12 months, one to two years, three to five years. All right, so our agenda this evening is gonna be uh, really in three different segments. Um, so with each of these, there'll be uh, a little bit of a didactic and then we'll have a challenge question set. So there'll be three of those, um, you know, moving back and forth between some, some data and then questions around those. And we'll talk more about how this uh, Kahoot and game platform works uh, as we get a little bit further along. Our objectives are really um, threefold. One, we wanna to try to discuss um, and answer questions around the challenges associated with adherence to antifibrotic therapy, talk about the potential role of stopping or switching antifibrotic therapy, and then I think perhaps most importantly, you know, how do we work as a community with primary care providers, advanced practice providers, nurses, therapists, as a whole team to try to recognize the early signs and symptoms of ILD, make an accurate diagnosis um, you know, of pulmonary fibrosis as well as other fibrotic lung diseases, and then work together to manage comorbidities and really just try to do the best for our patients as a team. So as I alluded to, this is no ordinary session. Um, the platform that uh, this game takes on is called Kahoot. So now I uh, ask you to either on your mobile phone or if you wanna open a new browser um, to go to www.kahoot.it and we'll get more to that, but you'll be ready uh, by getting there uh, to log in and that'll be the game platform. So www.kahoot.it. And we'll get back to that in just a second, but you'll be ready to go. So our first section, partnering with PCPs and other community providers, we really took a focus on, on diagnosis. Um, and if you look at from when people have had symptoms and, and the unfortunate or just the reality that you know, the symptoms of pulmonary fibrosis are nonspecific. It's cough, you know, shortness of breath that tends to be more insidious and onset and fatigue. So if you can imagine, you know, putting on your primary care provider hat, I mean, there's tons of patients that walk through the door. So it's not 
surprising that people often have delays of, of one to two years before they present with symptoms and the diagnosis of IPF is made. And they're often misdiagnosed with more common things like asthma, airway disease, COPD, emphysema, cardiac disease. But as we know with the antifibrotic therapies for pulmonary fibrosis, they don't stop or reverse the disease, they slow progression. So the earlier we can make a diagnosis, the earlier we have a chance to intervene and slow the progression of lung disease. You know, if we're talking to our primary care community and trying to get them a message of, you know, when should you suspect ILD? As I mentioned, the symptoms are very nonspecific. Shortness of breath, cough that tends to be dry, certainly early in the disease, fatigue. I think one of the keys is, is asking them to listen hard for crackles. Um, I'm fortunate I have, you know, really good med students that work with me every week and, you know, the new med students come in and, and they've read the chart ahead of time. They even know what they're going to be seeing, but they'll still come out and they'll miss the crackles. So crackles are easy to talk about, but I think they're very hard to find in real life. So really this message at least of, of you know, listening hard for crackles in these nonspecific symptoms, it, that's gonna pull you away from thinking of airway disease and get you down a path of, of looking for uh, interstitial lung disease. In terms of physiology, we're gonna see a restrictive ventilatory defect as opposed to an obstructive ventilatory defect that we would see with asthma or COPD. And we'll talk in a minute a little bit more about HRCT or, or imaging. When we're thinking about making a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we know that the diagnosis of IPF requires two things. It requires, and in my mind, I think of this kind of like a jury, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, there's nothing else that can be explaining the, why the ILD is present. There's no medications, there's no underlying lung disease. So part of our role is up here on the top left of can we find a cause? Because if we can find a cause, we're going to want to try to treat that underlying disease or remove that exposure. But if after all that extensive history and, and evaluation, we can't find a cause it's and it, it's idiopathic, then the question is, is it IPF or is it one of the other idiopathic interstitial pneumonias? If it's idiopathic, the question to get to IPF is, does the CT scan, or if we get a biopsy, show a pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia? Because making a diagnosis of IPF is exclusion of known causes and finding a pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia either on CT or histopathology. And we know from the 2018 recommendations, the guidelines, there's really kind of four different CT patterns. The first pattern is just, this is UIP. We don't need to do a biopsy in these cases. You know, the, the pattern is peripheral, lower lobe. Um, it shows honeycombing, it shows traction bronchiectasis, it shows uh, reticulation, but it doesn't show other features like mosaic attenuation, ground glass, a lot of nodules or non-honeycomb cysts. So when we see this pattern, we call this usual interstitial pneumonia. Again, the pattern is not the diagnosis. We have to put it in the clinical context, but idiopathic UIP is the diagnosis of IPF. Now, the next pattern is the one that we struggle a lot with, which we call probable UIP. Here we have the correct distribution. It's peripheral, it's lower lobe. We do have reticulation. We have scarring as evidenced by traction bronchiectasis. But as hard as I try to convince my radiologist, I can't convince them to, to admit to me that there's honeycombing there. So what we do with these probable UIP cases is we look at the clinical context. If it tends to be someone who's older, where we know IPF is more common, we'll likely stop there. If it's a younger person and maybe there's signs or symptoms or a suspicion of maybe there's something else going on like an autoimmune disease, it's in those patients where we may actually do a lung biopsy. So probable UIP, very similar to definite UIP, but lacks honeycombing. And we really start looking into the, the clinical, the pretest probability that IPF is present. The third pattern is what we would call indeterminate. These are often more subtle CT findings or they're CT findings where there's just kind of an even mixture of ground glass and reticulation. These are the patients where we think more or at least are doing more biopsies in because the CT scan is really just what it says, indeterminate. It could be UIP or it could be something else. And those are where we start to think about potentially using genomic classifiers or uh, surgical lung biopsy. And then the fourth pattern is it's just not UIP. You've got mosaic attenuation making you think of hypersensitivity pneumonia. You've got a lot of ground glass. You have other things going on uh, that are taking you away from thinking that the pattern is UIP.
So, you know, we talk about thinking about ILD, you know, that cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, nonspecific symptoms, listening hard for crackles, doing a detailed clinical evaluation to try to find the cause, see what the CT scan looks like. If after that clinical evaluation and that radiographic evaluation, we feel the probability of IPF is high, we can stop there. If not, then we start thinking about the role of, of uh, other invasive testing, such as surgical lung biopsy. So I want to get to a, a case now. So our case is John. He's a 62-year-old gentleman with cough who was referred for evaluation of ILD. The cough started in May of 2020. He had mild dyspnea. His symptoms were actually worse uh, with meals and activity. He had frequent throat clearing. His cough resolved uh, you know, six months or so later when he was prescribed omeprazole and nasal ipratropium. No significant past medical history. Social history, he was a physician, never smoker, and no birds, molds, or other exposures. His physical exam was really just remarkable for crackles. Oops, sorry about that. Pulmonary function testing, FVC was 70% of predicted. He did not have obstruction by FEV1 FVC ratio and DLC was 75% of predicted. And so now what we're gonna do is, is get on to the Kahoot, the, the disease challenge. We're gonna play three sets of games. It's actually interesting that speed matters. So it's not just getting the right answer, but the faster you get the right answer, the more points you score. So fast, correct scoring is gonna get you the most points. After the final round, the top three scores will appear on the podium and the winner will be declared. I'd like to say that you get a check for $10,000, but I couldn't get that through the uh, ACCP chess guidelines. So it's just gonna be you know, a, a pat on the back. Here, the questions will look like this. You'll see the game on and you'll see the different choices there. And then you can click on your device or your browser to answer. <laughs> all right, so we are all over the, uh, the country and in, including uh, outside with uh, one from, uh, from Montreal. So, so welcome everyone. The importance of educating on signs of IPF for early referral is highlighted by delays in diagnosis, which are often one to six months, one to two years, seven to 12 months, or three to five years. Yeah, so most of you got the correct answer. You know, it's about one to two years. Chris, I don't know if you, that's what you see with, with a lot of your referrals of people that have, you know, gone down a path and had symptoms for a while before they, you know, realize they have ILD and get, get sent your way for, for further, you know, thoughts on diagnosis and treatment. Yeah, I think that's pretty typical. And a lot of people get labeled uh, inappropriately with COPD and show up with inhalers that they may or may not need. I think that's a, a fairly common uh, thing that happens as well. All right, we can move on. All right, so we've got, you know, close competition here, Robert. It's got four point lead on Dan D, but, but it's tight at the top. All right, so here's a CT scan from our patient. Um, you know, this is from, from May 21. Actually, I had an earlier study, didn't show much change. And so I'm not gonna do a lot of describing here. I'm gonna let you guys you know, look at this and, and we're gonna see what your thoughts are, you know, moving forward here. So how would you characterize the CT pattern? Would you think definite UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate or suggestive of an alternative diagnosis? All right, well, we are, except for definite UIP, we're kind of across the board. Chris, how would you, what would you uh, classify this as? Uh, you know, there's a fair amount of ground glass and I could see some traction bronchiectasis. Um, I think indeterminate probably fits best. I could see how people would call this 
alternative diagnosis, though. I didn't think it was definite UIP for sure. Um, and I think probable UIP, there was enough features that were uh, inconsistent that I, I think uh, I, I, I think I would probably go with uh, either indeterminate or alternative di diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, we thought, you know, we called it indeterminate, you know, because of the mixture of reticulation and ground glass. Um, certainly, if we had to go beyond that, I think more alternative diagnosis than either of the UIPs, again, primarily because of the, the amount of ground glass that was there. All right, so the question is gonna be, what would you recommend at this time? Observation and no further workup as the patient really has very few symptoms. Confirm a diagnosis of IPF. Perform bronchoscopy with genomic classification for UIP or refer for thoracic surgery for surgical lung biopsy. Yeah, so nice mix. Um, you know, I think we have about half of the audience or so thinking potentially bronchoscopy with genomic classification, um, a little bit more than half um, referring on for surgical lung biopsy. Chris, I'm curious what your thoughts are in, in your practice with, you know, the Invisia classifier and bronch and genomic classification versus the more traditional surgical lung biopsy. We, we generally pursue traditional surgical lung biopsy. We have, you know, our thoracic surgery program is quite good. And most patients uh, don't even spend the night in the hospital after a VATS biopsy. And so it's not much more of a, a risk if, uh, if you carefully select. And, and I think, uh, you know, if you don't get a UIP diagnosis on, on your, uh, like, genomic testing, uh, then you're still sort of left, uh, you know, scratching your head a little bit in terms of what to do. And so I think if you want a more concrete, definitive answer, um, then I think surgical lung biopsy would be our approach. Yeah, we're in the same boat. We very rarely are, have been using the genomic classifier. I think we usually fit into a, a scenario where we either feel that it's the CT is probably UIP, so we're pretty confident and we just stop there, or like this case, the CT just looks, you know, so kind of bizarre, you know, that we're really not sure what we're going to see and, and think that, you know, even if the genomic classifier came back with UIP, will we believe it? And right. if it doesn't, like you said, you're still then moving on for a, you know, a surgical biopsy. So I don't know where we'll be in, in 12 or 24 months. Um, you know, maybe we'll all understand it a little bit better, but right now we're, we tend to be a little bit more traditional as well and, and tend to move, move towards, you know, working with our thoracic surgeons and getting, you know, histopathology that we can look at, which if we move on to the next slide, And that's what was done um, in this case. You can see the histopathology there, you know, a lot of fibrosis. It's a very pink lesion, but yet it's very diffuse and homogeneous. There's not a lot of temporal um, heterogeneity in there that we would see in, in UIP. If we move on to the next slide, you know, the, the interpretation, this was a chronic interstitial fibrosis pneumonia. It was a little bit of peribronchial metaplasia, suggesting some possible airway disease. There was no honeycombing. There was no fibroblastic foci, no giant cells or granuloma. So the honeycombing fibroblastic foci are things that you would want to see with, with usual interstitial pneumonia. So those were lacking. Uh, giant cells, granulomas, things like HP, those were lasting, uh, were lacking as well. And really, it came down to this being a, a diagnosis of fibrotic, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Now, the next slide, we can get to our diagnosis, which I guess I already gave away, essentially. <laughs> so, IPF, NSIP, unclassifiable or progressive ILD. Yeah, and so the, the diagnosis was nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. There's a really, you know, good question in the chat that says, can you correlate that back to the CT? 
which showed, seemed to show some subpleural sparing, and, and that's a really excellent pickup. Um, one of the features when we did the NSIP workshop of the CT scans was that there was um, a feature of subpleural sparing. It's not there in all cases, uh, but when it is there, it does kind of lead your likelihood that that might be what you're dealing with uh, more in that direction. So um, a really good teaching point and uh, appreciate the, the chat bringing that up to, to talk about that. All right, what should be the recommended next step at this time? Observation and no current treatment as he is asymptomatic. Antifibrotic therapy with either perfenadone or natinidine or high dose corticosteroids. Yeah, so mixture most, you know, favoring high dose corticosteroids. Um, in terms of the antifibrotic therapies, you know, profenadone is only approved for IPF, so that would not be recommended. Natinidib is approved for IPF or other ILDs that are getting worse in terms of progression, which we don't have in this case. So I think either of the antifibrotics would not be our, our therapies at this point. You can make an argument about observation, you know, doesn't have symptoms but yet. There's a lot of ground glass and, and things going on in that CT scan, which at least for me would make me a little bit uncomfortable, not at least having a good discussion about potential therapy. So I think uh, I'm gonna go through the next couple cases. Uh, uh, so this is uh, the case from, uh, from this patient, uh, a 62-year-old male, uh, probable NSIP. He was elected to be treated with prednisone. And so I guess this is sort of the wrap-up. Uh, clinical follow-up uh, shows that he tolerated the prednisone without side effects and his, his breathing overall improved. Uh, so as you can see, his uh, FVC increased and, uh, and he felt better. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump into our... Uh, uh, it's talking a little bit about antifibrotic therapy and some of the, the studies, the rationale, some of the pitfalls, and, and sort of how, how best to get patients on therapy and, and what the studies that have been done so far have shown. And so we'll start out with a case again. So this is Sam. He's a 69-year-old white male uh, who's referred for shortness of breath, uh, fairly typical past medical history, OSA on CPAP and hypertension. He used to smoke. He has about 30 pack years, but quit 10 years ago. Uh, no history of connective tissue disease. He doesn't really have any uh, HP exposures on his history. They did CTD serologies, and those were negative. He's got no family history of interstitial lung disease. His physical exam is remarkable for the crackles uh, that uh, Dr. Flaherty mentioned uh, when uh, talking about things to look for, and, and he has some mild clubbing. And his PFT showed mo uh, moderate restriction with an FVC of 68% predicted. And here's his CT scan. So uh, he's you know, got the kind of subpleural uh, honeycombing by basilar distribution, not a lot of ground glass. Uh, and, and so a UIP pattern. And so based on this UIP pattern, the absence of a definitive cause, uh, you make a diagnosis of IPF. And the plan is to start the patient on antifibrotic therapy. And so, you know, years ago, uh, making the diagnosis of uh, interstitial lung disease, in particular IPF, was a pretty depressing conversation for patients. There really wasn't uh, much to offer them short of, uh, you know, potentially lung transplant. Um, you know, a lot of the previous trials were, were negative, but in uh, October 2014, two different uh, drugs get approved uh, for treatment of IPF, profenadone and nitetinib. And so uh, profenadone, the, the mechanism's incompletely understood. It's an antifibrotic, and it's thought that the uh, inhibition of uh, TGF-beta has some uh, responsibility for these antifibrotic uh, properties. It's also an anti-inflammatory that suppresses TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-12, and IL-8. And it's thought that, it, you know, if you try and go after one specific sort of uh, cytokine or uh, 
you know that that you're likely to fail but if more these uh, drugs uh, are more successful because they have these more pleiotropic uh, effects and so uh, there were a few different studies that led to the approval of, uh, of profenadone. So capacity was two uh, randomized trials that were run concurrently, uh, right around 800 patients uh, between the two trials. And the, the endpoint of all these trials looking at antifibrotics was the uh, comparison in the rate of decline in FVC uh, between the uh, control group and the treatment group. And so one of these studies uh, in capacity showed a, an, a, a statistically significant uh, decrease in the uh, rate of decline, whereas the other didn't. So the FDA asked the, uh, asked per, the makers of profenadone to go back and do a, another clinical trial uh, to kind of split the difference. And so that's where the ASCEND trial came from. So it was 555 patients, 52 weeks in duration. And there were a bunch of positive endpoints that favored the profenadone group. So there was about a 48% relative risk reduction in patients with regards to decline in, in FEC of 10% or more, 132% increase in the proportion of patients with no decline in FEC, a reduced decline in six-minute walk test distance, and improved progression-free uh, progression -free survival. And th again, this is the primary endpoint is looking at uh, change in FEC, and you can see the, the profenadone group, while they still progress, uh, uh, they progressed at a slower rate than the placebo group. And so, unfortunately, antifibrotics aren't perfect. So there's there's some uh, issues with with esbriad or, or profenadone. It's a, a lot of pills per day. You know, there is an option once you're on full dose therapy to switch to, you know, the 801 pills. So three pills per day as opposed to nine pills per day. Um, but there's uh, but it, after, you have to sort of titrate up over time. Uh, there's a fair amount of GI side effects, and, and, and some patients do really struggle with GI side effects. You have to take it with meals, and, and you have to do LFT monitoring. I think overall, um, you know, most patients with appropriate counseling on how to take it uh, can, can get on therapy and, and stay on therapy, but there are some patients that, that do really struggle. Uh, and the other antifibrotic is natetinib, which the brand name is OFEV. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, that blocks uh, derived growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, and uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. And so uh, one of the early studies uh, looking at uh, natetinib was the tomorrow trial, 423 patients, four different uh, doses in placebo, and they found that the high dose, 150 milligrams BID, which is the dose that, that we currently uh, use, trended toward reducing the rate of decline and had fewer acute exacerbations. Um, and then that led to the, the next trial, which was the Impulsus trial, which was, again, one of these concurrent uh, studies where they did two arms, Impulsus 1 and Impulsus 2, simultaneously, both 52-week studies, and they enrolled a, a total of about 1,000 patients. Um, and again, demonstrated a decrease in the annual rate of change in FVC. And so you can see a fairly substantial difference uh, in both groups, actually. And this is, um, you know, again, uh, another way of demonstrating that, that the, the nitatinib arm uh, had a, a much slower rate of decline in the force vital capacity uh, than the placebo group. But again, uh, you know, side effects uh, come with these medications, and diarrhea was the big side effect seen uh, in the OFEV group, and it's something you can anticipate and, and really need to counsel patients, uh, you know, with regards to this. So about 60% of patients uh, develop uh, diarrhea in some form. Some patients, it's really uh, quite, uh, you know, severe, whereas a lot of, a lot of patients with Imodium, and, uh, it can be very manageable. Um, what, you know, one question that we're often asked, and Kevin, maybe you can speak to this, when you're faced with the decision to start somebody on antifibrotics, uh, how do you go about uh, deciding which agent you would select for an individual patient? Yeah, you know, they, they work equally well, um, you know, so really almost always it comes down to patient preference in terms of dosing, as you highlighted you know, the number of pills and three times a day versus two, and then the potential side effects. And it's, you know, what do you fear 
you know, <laughs> more. Uh, you know, some people already have, you know, a lot of irritable bowel type syndromes. And so the thought of having an, an agent that causes, you know, diarrhea is really scary or, or, you know, some of my patients, you know, just love being out in the sun, you know, being out on the water during the, the summer. So like, I don't want to worry about sunscreen. So, so really most of the time it's, it's based on, you know, the dosing and, and which side effects they feel if they have one, cause not everybody gets a side effect, but if they get a side effect, you know, which one could they potentially deal with the best? Um, I think the other thing I talk to patients about is the side effects go away, you know, so, you know, yeah, they sound scary, but give it a try. And if, if you don't have side effects, that's great. You know, a lot of patients don't, but if you do, if I stop the medicines or we can talk some perhaps later down the road about, you know, strategies of dose titration and things to, to mitigate the side effects, but, but it's not like you started something and then you're stuck with that side effect for, for all eternity. So, you know, sometimes we just talk about doing a, a trial and, you know, an error just to see how things go. Now, we, our approach is, is very similar. I think if you counsel people and they know to expect it, uh, that it's that they, are, they have much more success getting on drug and staying on drug. And, and they're pleasantly surprised if they don't have side effects. Um, again, with uh, OFEV or Natetinib, you, there's some LFT monitoring that's required. Um, you know, again, the diarrhea is usually mild to moderate response to loperamide, uh, although some cases uh, can be a little more severe. There were some rare side effects, uh, a little more bleeding in the uh, natetinib group uh, and arterial thrombotic events in about 2.5% of the patients. And so a lot of times if patients have very significant coronary artery disease, I'll, I'll tend to steer clear of it and, and sort of steer them more toward uh, esbriot. But if, uh, but I don't, you know, if somebody has an intolerance to esbriot, it's not uh, a big enough worry for me to keep them off antifibrotic therapy completely. And uh, the bleeding things, I, I, you know, if they're on anticoagulation and I have the option to to choose uh, esbriot, I will. But if, uh, if again, if they've tried esbriot and it didn't work for them, or if they really are just uh, worried about, you know, the uh, sun sensitivity and things like that, I will still use uh, nitetinib in the, in the um, inpatients who were anticoagulator or have a history of coronary disease. Yeah, we have the same, same approach. Um, so there's, um, you know, increasing data. Again, the, these kind of these studies initially focused on force gut vital capacity. And I think a lot of times you get questions about, you know, how does that translate uh, into other things like, you know, survival. And so uh, this study looked at uh, long term uh, results and was from the Insights IPF registry. And they found that uh, patients, this is survival, so it's kind of a Kaplan-Meier curve looking at survival. And you can see patients that were on antifibrotic therapy uh, seem to live longer uh, at one and two years follow-up. Uh, you know, they had a much, they had a higher likelihood of, of surviving to one and two years than patients not on antifibrotics. And so I think there's increasing sort of uh, data that's suggestive of a mortality benefit of antifibrotics. None of it is, is completely concrete because it's all registry type uh, data, um, but, it, but it is suggestive of that. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the discussions that we used to have about three to five year survival for IPF, uh, you know, I think it's being borne out that, that maybe that's, that's changing a little bit. So we talked about this a little bit. I, you know, the with the data we have to date, there's uh, I think clinical equipoise, and and it's really difficult to try and pin down or look at the studies and say, well, this one had you know uh, you know this rate of decline versus this because the the groups were a little bit different in the criteria they used to enroll them, and so we really personalize our decision based on a side on the side effect profile. You know, I wonder if one day we'll get to a point where we can phenotype patients where we could figure out if they're going to respond better to one of these individualized drugs than than the other, um, but uh, but we're not quite there yet. Um, another common question that we get is, you know. What about the patient that's got really mild disease or really severe disease? Um, you know, does it make a difference? And, and this study looked at patients whose force vital capacity was less than 80% versus greater than 80%. And the GAP scoring system is uh, 
it's a uh, it's gender, age, and and physiology. So it incorporates FVC. Uh, gender and, and age to sort of risk stratify patients into three categories, and it didn't matter if they were in the more severe groups or the uh, or the less severe group. Uh, all it seems like there's a, a an effect that favors profenadone sort of across the board in all comers. And um, do you limit uh, who you prescribe to? So say somebody comes in, they're relatively asymptomatic, but they have a pretty clear diagnosis of IPF. Would you prescribe antifibrotics to that patient? So we talk about it to all our patients, um, and, and I do believe these data, as well as, you know, there's other data from, you know, at the Australian registry and, and things, you know, people progress at all stages, and the drugs seem to slow progression at all stages. Um, but if I had to say what my gestalt was, I think it's probably more common for people that are early on and more asymptomatic to, to be a little bit slower in terms of starting therapy. Um, that's not because we say, oh, you shouldn't worry about it. You're not going to progress. But, you know, when you weigh the pros and cons, if, if they're a little bit earlier on, you know, most of those may wait a little bit longer, but we monitor them very closely and start, and we certainly offer everybody antifibrotic therapy from the time of diagnosis and tell them that, that this is a disease that does progress. But then again, it gets to their decision and, and, uh, people that are, are early on and feel pretty good. You know, sometimes when they look at the potential side effects, they're like, you know what, I'm, I just want to watch this for a little while. I want to get my head around this this diagnosis before I start a therapy. And we we generally, you know, try to counsel them to start antifibrotics. We worry that you know any lung function that's lost, you're not really going to get back. And so once you progress to fibrosis, you know, once it's obvious that you've had a loss of lung function, you know. It, you know, you're not going to re regain that lung function. So we, we tend to be sort of early adopters and, and start, start therapy early. I guess conversely, in patients with more severe disease, sometimes there's this nihilistic view that like, well, they're very severe, they're bad off, you know, why subject them to the side effects? But, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times we as you mentioned, patients tolerate antifibrotics better than you might think, and, and they may be relatively asymptomatic. And, and if you can slow their progression, it's, uh, I think it's still a good thing. And so a lot of times, unless they're really, you know, uh, bad off, kind of more, you know, more abundant, uh, we think have a very limited uh, survival, we do uh, start patients with more severe disease on, on therapy as well. I agree. This is an, uh, just a study looking at OFEV or Natatinib and uh, similar things. So they looked at FVC greater than 50% versus less than 50%. And the, uh, the uh, rate of decline uh, was similar in, in both groups. And, and so uh, sort of argues that, that uh, it doesn't really matter what your starting uh, force vital capacity is. There's some, the, a chance for benefit in, in both groups. So let's jump into the uh, to the uh, game round. If if anybody's joining late uh, in the chat box, uh, there's instructions on on how to uh, get onto the Kahoot app and put in the pin number uh, so that you can play along as well. So the primary studies leading to the approval. Uh, leading to approval of antifibrotics demonstrated improvement in what primary outcome compared to placebo? All right, you guys nailed this one. So, uh, uh, forced uh, vital capacity, and so the prime the uh, somebody in the chat box mentioned acute exacerbations. There was a signal toward uh, decreased risk of acute exacerbations, uh, but it wasn't the primary uh, endpoint of of the studies, and and there was a little bit of a a split in the impulsive study uh, with regards to that, and so. Um, I would say the best answer would be decreased rate of decline in FVC. So Seth remains on top. <laughs> 
And then which of the following statements reflects our current understanding of antifibrotic therapy for IPF? All right, you guys nailed that one as well. So equally efficacious. Um, you know, there. I think the there was one person that answered uh, the profinito and demonstrated improved survival. Early on, there was some uh, like if you did a meta analysis and you squished all the uh, studies. Uh, leading to approval of profenadone together, you could make the argument that there was a survival benefit with those trials, but not with the OFEV data. Um, but I think, uh, again, uh, we think of them as equally efficacious, and I don't think there's clear-cut uh, data demonstrating improved survival from the uh, randomized clinical trials. So again, I think the best answer is probably the uh, uh, equally efficacious. All right, Seth continues to hang on to the lead. Which statement best reflects the data on antifibrotics in IPF? So agreed, uh, I think uh, patients uh, stand to benefit from antifibrotics regardless of their forest vital capacity uh, when, when they're initiated. All right, so the leaderboard uh, flipping around a little bit for second and third, but I think uh, Seth continues to command the lead. Uh, this is our last section, so we're going to look at adherence and uh, uh, of of uh, how how to sort of achieve adherence. So um, we can move on to the next slide. So another case, Grace. She's a 67 year old uh, woman with no past medical history who notices some mild shortness of breath that leads to a CT scan and PFT. She is a former smoker with 25 pack years, no CTD exposure or no CTD symptoms, and uh, no chronic uh, hypersensitivity pneumonia exposures, no family history, negative serologic evaluation for CTD, and mild restriction with an FVC of 80% predicted. So she has uh, this scan. This is a very good example of, I think, of an indeterminate scan where there's some uh, subpleural reticulation, but no traction bronchiectasis, no overt honeycombing, no signs of an alternative diagnosis. Um, and so based on that, she's referred for biopsy, and the biopsy comes back consistent with UIP because there's uh, no identifiable cause, but working diagnosis of IPF is made, and you plan to start an antifibrotic. Um, so given what we've talked about so far, and uh, you know we're a little bit time constrained, but we had a ton of slides uh, earlier that looked at hospitalizations. There's data on reduction in hospitalizations. There's data on acute exacerbations, as one of our panelists uh, are, uh, or one of our uh, participants astutely mentioned, you know, decrease in force vital capacity, all those things. It seems like it's a no-brainer to start antifibrotics in patients once you make a diagnosis of IPF. So how, do, how are we doing in the real world? This study looked at uh, kind of registry data uh, from Medicare patients and uh, that carried a diagnosis of IPF. And you can see the number of patients that actually end up on drug is quite small. It's only about 20% in that population uh, overall. Uh, and this is, you know, we're getting even into 2019. So these drugs have been out for five years at that point. And so it's still, you know, kind of a dismal rate of, uh, of acceptance and starting uh, patients.
Um, so again, that, that study is about 11,000 patients. Uh, about 26% ended up on antifibrotics, and a lot of the patients ended up discontinuing their medications, about 43%. And so, you know, why the low rate of prescribing? I think there's a lot of issues uh, that could lead to this. Costs can be uh, prohibitive sometimes, although uh, there's assistance programs. Uh, uh, concern about side effects or actual side effects, I think, could be uh, barriers. And then um, I think it depends how you explain these therapies to patients. Um, you know, the perceived lack of improvement. Patients, I think, uh, struggle with that a little bit and you say this pill won't necessarily make you feel better but it's going to make your lung disease uh, you know will slow the rate of decline how do you go about explaining that to patients uh, in a way that uh, you know it's where you set the expectations for uh, when you're starting therapy yeah I think it's exactly that it's a lot of education and setting expectations um, I think you really made a really good point earlier that, you know, once we lose lung function, we can never get it back. Um, so although it may not take away your oxygen needs if you're on them now or make you feel better now, it will hopefully, you know, slow progression so that, you know, you can, you know, have a slower disease course. Um, side effects, we can manage those. They go away if we stop. We could try, you know, switching medicines. So not being scared of the potential side effects. Um, and then cost, that's another thing that I, I see a lot of people um, that actually had thought about antifibrotics before their referral and heard how expensive they are. And they are, you know, the retail is extremely expensive, um, but no one went through what the prior authorization was or that there are assistance programs and that, you know, most of the time we're very successful in figuring out ways for people to get access to these medicines without, you know, dipping into their checkbooks more than, than typical medicine. So, so I think it's a lot of, um, we spend a lot of time and it sounds like you guys do as well, you know, after the initial diagnosis, really talking about the benefit of these medicines, the tolerability and how we can make them tolerable, or if we can't switch to the other one and, and but giving it a try. Um, and then how we, on our end, work with the prior authorization to, to help the patients get access. It's not, I think, you know, you look at our patient population, most of these people are a little bit older, right? You know, you, you tell them, yeah, the drug is almost $100,000 a year. It's a stop, right? Like, well, I can't do that. Right. It's like, no, we're going to do that for you, right? You know, we're going we're gonna to work with you and we're going to try to figure that out. Let us help you with that. Um, so it's a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time. We're fortunate, you know, at our ILD center to have a lot of resources that we can can enlist to help the patients with that. Um, but that's, that's our approach. It's, it's a lot of education and a lot of working with patients to, to get them over the fear of the side effect, the fear of the potential cost to get trying on these. And, and most people do actually pretty well. Uh, and, you know, some of those issues, uh, as you mentioned, the patient experience centers that are that are used to dealing with side effects and counseling patients and sort of have the time at individual visits to to go through some of the counseling and and have the administrative support to, to do the prior authorizations, I think may have more success in sort of getting people on. This is from the IPF Pro Registry. And so, you know, they got 70% of their patients treated. And uh, of those treated, you know, there was still some dropout rate, but it was uh, significantly lower. And so, again, I think there's a lot of reasons that that could be true, that uh, these, uh, you know, patients that are able to get to, uh, you know, uh, a, a center of excellence, you know, maybe they're more functional, maybe, uh, and, uh, and sort of uh, more motivated to start with. Um, and also, again, the counseling, support, management of side effects, all those things I think could be responsible for the su success in the registry patients versus sort of all comers in that uh, Medicare uh, database. Um, just wanted to point out that there, there are some uh, there's advice out there on how best to manage side effects. Frank uh, 
Rahagi uh, at Mayo Clinic in uh, Florida. Um, he's sort of the king of the Delphi survey, and he did a Delphi consensus study on uh, how to manage side effects uh, from profenadone in patients with IPF. And, um, and so there is some guidance out there. I think the next slide goes through a little bit of sort of some of the uh, things that they highlighted, like take it with a meal, a substantial meal, uh, start eating before you take the drugs. Uh, there are some specific recommendations regarding the amount of calories, et cetera. And so there are some, there is some advice out there on how best to manage side effects, particularly gastrointestinal side effects in profenadone. And uh, there was another uh, Delphi survey on, um, on uh, nitatinib with sort of the same kind of uh, thing, which is here. I think we're getting a little tight on time, so I'm going to jump into our... Uh, questions. So based on available real-world data, what percentage of patients with IPF are started on antifibrotic therapy? And again, this is the real-world data. Uh, Again, if you join late, there's uh, instructions on how to get into the, the Kahoot app and the, uh, and the PIN number that you need uh, to play along at home is, is in, the, uh, in the chat box. So everybody did uh, pretty well with that. About 25% in, uh, uh, real, of real world patients uh, are started on uh, IPF uh, therapy. Seth, still hanging in there. And the next question, based on available real-world data, what percentage of patients discontinue therapy after starting antifibrotic? It's pretty impressive seeing the speed with which the uh, answers are coming in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we could even shorten this next time, huh? The, yeah. More time for discussion and less time for uh, uh So once again, everybody, uh, uh, for the most part, got this right. Uh, about 40% of patients discontinued in, in available real-world data. And uh, I think our final question coming up. For a patient prescribed nitatinib, which side effect is most likely to be encountered? All right, everybody uh, for the most part got that as well. There's certainly a risk for elevated liver enzymes and, uh, and, you, sh and you should be checking uh, LFTs, uh, but, uh, but diarrhea is the most common side effect. All right, he's had a streak of 11. So. Oh, I thought that was our last question, my apologies. So which of the following is uh, the appropriate counseling for a patient starting uh, profenadone? Looks like most of the answers are in again. Good, so you wanna take the medication with food. Again, taking on an empty stomach, uh, patients will be miserable and they'll end up quitting. And the, there's a titration, so you should really start out with one uh, tablet three, uh, three times a day. And the typical increase is to go up weekly. I, I actually sometimes, if you have somebody that's, that's frail or, or, or maybe it has some intolerance, I'll, I'll, do, I'll alter that. I don't know if that's your practice as well, Kevin. Yeah, sometimes we'll go slower. Um... You know, just to, to to you know, try to ease people's systems into it if if we need to. All right, so let's uh let's see who the winner is. And thanks to Genentech for sponsoring uh, this uh, 
this activity. Again, there's information on how to complete uh, and get uh, CME uh, credit for, for uh, participating in this. Seth. It looked like good participation. I would imagine it was just milliseconds uh, separating out the uh, competition because pretty much everybody was getting the right answers. Our, our questions maybe were too easy, it seems. Uh, or we just did such a great job uh, <laughs> presentation, right? Could be. I don't know. But certainly wanted to thank. Uh... Thanks, Chris. Great working with you on this. Uh, thank our sponsors. Thank everybody for logging in. Um, look forward to uh, the future where we can do this in, in person and, and not uh, not virtually. But uh, certainly appreciate everyone's uh, attention and participation tonight. So thank you all. And I don't, I don't know if there's any questions. There's a Q&A box or the chat box. Seems like no questions. <laughs> right. Everybody's uh, ready for the rest of their Sunday evening. Must be time for Sunday night football. <laughs> I guess so. Now, so one person uh, asked, uh, are there any concise handouts you use to educate patients about medications? Um, there's certainly uh, materials out there. I, Pilot, I believe, has some, uh, and PFF uh, has uh, a lot of um, uh, um, handouts and patient education uh, materials on their website. So you may check the PFF website. Yep, as I said, the same. Yeah. Or pilot from right. org. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your evening and uh, stay safe.